Hello and welcome to my second lecture on hallucinogens. Uh, last time I considered LSD, which is in many ways the most famous of the hallucinogenic drugs, but by far the only one. In this lecture I'm going to consider two other hallucinogens. The first is mushrooms, and really here I'm not even talking about all psychedelic or hallucinogenic mushrooms, but really uh, psilocybin bearing mushrooms. I'll talk a little bit about their history, a little bit about some of the acute effects and the chronic effects of uh, psilocybin in these sources. And then in the second part of the lecture I'm going to talk about MDMA or ecstasy or sometimes more recently called molly. And I'll again talk about the history and the pharmacology and the acute effects and the chronic effects and some of the risks potentially associated with using this drug. Um, as I said in the last lecture, hallucinogens are this really uh, broad and kind of diverse and very interesting group of drugs. Um, in thinking of these lectures, I, I was very tempted to go into great length about all the different kinds of hallucinogenic drugs out there, but really you could do a whole semester's worth of teaching on just the hallucinogens and you'd only be scratching the surface. By picking um, LSD, psilocybin, and MDMA, I think I'm kind of covering some of the more popularly used hallucinogens and maybe some of the ones that I think are a little bit easier to access in terms of the information we have about them. Anyway, I hope you'll find this stuff interesting. Let's get started. First off, let's talk about mushrooms. And again, to be clear, there are a lot of mushrooms out there that if you take them can exert some really powerful uh, sometimes hallucinogenic, sometimes neurotoxic effects on your body. I'm really going to limit myself to just one uh, group of those, the psilocybin mushrooms, but they are um, among the more popular psychedelic mushrooms out there. So what do we know about the history of these, uh, uh, of these uh, plants? Well, not really plants, they're fungi. The genus psilocybe, it's a genus of fungi, a genus of uh, mushrooms, um, that all produce different levels of different alkaloids, and for our purposes, the one that we're really interested in is called psilocybin. Now, these mushrooms are native to Mexico and to Central America. They can also be found elsewhere, including in North America. And we have reason to believe that historically, they were part of different uh, ceremonies by peoples um, who are indigenous to that region. So for instance, uh, if we look at what we know about the Aztec civilization, um, there is archeological evidence of the use of uh, sacred mushrooms that may be uh, psilocybin mushrooms, or they may, may be some other sort of mushrooms. And the very difficult to pronounce word, teonanakatl, gosh, that's not even close, or God's flesh comes down to us. Um, as, uh, as kind of some linguistic evidence that people consumed these mushrooms and um, perhaps experienced hallucinogenic or maybe religious tinged experiences as a result. Now, to be clear, in other parts of the world, other types of mushrooms and other fungi were consumed for similar psychedelic effects. Right here, we're focusing on psilocybin mushrooms. And again, they're native to the Americas. Uh, they were known, as is often the case when we talk about drugs, they were known by uh, ancient and indigenous peoples for hundreds if not thousands of years. They were used um, apparently in ceremonial or religious contexts. Um, however, a lot of the knowledge about uh, this, uh, these mushrooms was lost during the Spanish conquest of the 1500s when the Aztec and other civilizations were destroyed and um, because of the conquest and because of the spread of Christianity, uh, the idea of the religious use of these drugs somewhat disappeared or rather went kind of underground. So the history of this drug goes way, way back, but then kind of disappears or, or again goes underground for a, a long period of time all the way up until the 1950s. And so in a sense, you know, it's, it's incorrect to call this the discovery of mushrooms. It was the discovery of mushrooms or psilocybin mushrooms by Americans and by other white people. Uh, but if we go up into the 1950s, we meet interesting people like George Wasson. He was a, a kind of a traveler. He was kind of a, an ethnobotanist in the sense that he was interested in the plants and fungi that different people around the world consumed uh, for different reasons. And he was invited to participate on a trip to Mexico in a mushroom eating ceremony. And he actually wrote about this experience in Life magazine in 1957. 
And uh, there's some really interesting uh, descriptions come down to us from this experience. Um, Wasman uh, describes eating the magic mushrooms and then reports later, uh, quote, it permits you to travel backwards and forwards in time to enter other planes of existence, even to know God. Your body lies in the darkness, heavy as lead, but your spirit seems to soar and to leave the hut. And with the speed of thought, you travel and you listen. And in time and space, you're accompanied by the shaman singing. At last, you know the ineffable, what the ineffable is and what ecstasy means. Ecstasy. Uh, the mind harks back to the origin of that word. For the Greeks, ecstasy meant the flight of the soul from your body. Can you describe, or can you find a better word to describe this state? So in this writing and in other writings, he talked about these kind of amazing experiences that he'd had while consuming um, these mushrooms that seemed to transport him, or at least transport his mind, into totally different places and have him experiencing the world around him in profoundly different ways than he would without the, ex the uh, experience of, the, of this drug. Now these reports uh, got a lot of people's attention, including our friend uh, Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist who you'll remember uh, synthesized LSD, or he first isolated it from uh, from ergot and then was able to synthesize it in his laboratory. He basically did the same thing with psilocybin. He was able to isolate it from psilocybin bearing mushrooms and then later develop a synthetic version of it. And a little bit like LSD, there was kind of a popularity or, or a curiosity around this drug, psilocybin. Uh, it wasn't something that seemed to have any obvious medical use. You know, it didn't seem to you know, eliminate pain or it didn't seem to make people particularly sleepy or particularly awake. So it's not the sort of thing that drug companies were in a big rush to market um, you know, to widely, you know, to, to doctors and hospitals, etc. But it did seem to have some potentially therapeutic purposes because of the really profound ways in which it seemed to change people's thinking or their perception of the world around them. And a bit like uh, we saw with LSD, there was a history or a period of time in history when people began to experiment, uh, you know, formally or informally with the use of psilocybin. One of these people was Walter Pankey, an American psych uh, psychiatrist and minister who in 1963 conducted what we call the Good Friday Experiment. In this experiment, he worked with a group of seminary students, people who were training to become ministers, and he gave half of them psilocybin in a capsule form and half of them vitamin B to form a comparison group. And those who received psilocybin by and large reported profound changes in the way they experienced the world around them, experience, uh, changes that had kind of a mystical or religious uh, tone to them, which is very similar, I suppose, to what Wasson had described in his non-experimental, you know, kind of anecdotal reporting earlier on. Now, by the standards of, uh, you know, today's science, this probably wasn't a great experiment because the people uh, in the study, the students, knew which group they were going into. The folks who were getting the psilocybin knew they were getting psilocybin, and the folks who weren't getting the psilocybin knew they weren't getting the psilocybin. So there wasn't uh, a really good comparison between actually getting the drug and not getting the drug while controlling for the expectation of having a drug experience. So it might just be the case that the people who knew they were having psilocybin were kind of inclined to feel that they were going to have a religious experience, whereas the people who uh, weren't getting psilocybin knew they weren't and were maybe a bit bummed out about that or depressed about that and knew they weren't going to have a particularly religious experience. Now, we'll see in the future, or rather we'll see in, in present time, there is ongoing research with psilocybin that more or less uh, comports with this early research. Uh, but it's worth pointing out now, this early research was, had some flaws in it, but did seem to kind of back up the general idea that something about taking psilocybin, maybe like taking some of the, the other hallucinogenic drugs, seems to change people's uh, perception of the world around them, often in a way which uh, encourages them to feel kind of mystical or religious in terms of their connection to the world. Another person who got kind of interested in psilocybin at this time was our friend Aldous Huxley, who we met in the last lecture, assuming you didn't already know about him. Uh, as you recall, I hope he wrote um, different uh, uh, pieces of fiction that were inspired by drugs. He wrote a book called The Island in 1962, which is kind of a utopian story, meaning it's uh, about a kind of an idealized civilization in which people consume mushrooms for a form of spiritual enlightenment. So sort of drawing on the interest that and generally in psychedelic drugs, perhaps particularly in the use of psilocybin mushrooms and other 
psychedelic mushrooms. And as we saw with LSD, this type of writing further kind of popularized the idea of psychedelic drugs or hallucinogenic drugs to the broader population. So, you know, in some ways, the story of, LS, uh, of psilocybin kind of parallels the story of LSD. So with that little bit of history in mind, let's skip ahead now and talk about the current use of mushrooms. What do we know about people's current use of hallucinogenic mushrooms, perhaps particularly uh, psilocybin-bearing mushrooms? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of really good data on, on people's rates of uh, use because most surveys don't ask specifically about mushrooms uh, or they just group them in with other hallucinogens. So, for example, if we look at the Monitoring the Future survey for 2014, the lifetime use of hallucinogens that aren't LSD among 12th graders is about 5%. So about 5% of 12th graders will say that they've ever tried a hallucinogen that wasn't LSD, and this could include uh, mushrooms, but it could also include other uh, uh, hallucinogenic drugs that we haven't yet talked about. If we look at uh, some of our uh, trends over the years, we see kind of a basic pattern um, that mirrors the overall pattern of drug use that we've seen uh, over the years where um, there was kind of a high point, uh, no pun intended, for drug use in the late 1970s or mid to late 1970s, declines through the 1980s, kind of a rebound in the 90s, and then a kind of a tabling off and decline in the early 2000s. And that's generally true for most drugs. It's true for, um, in this case, hallucinogens um, that aren't LSD. Again, if we um, look at National Survey of Drug Use and Health, here they just generally include hallucinogens altogether, and so this includes LSD, but also includes uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, like we saw in the last lecture. The lifetime prevalence among all people aged 12 or older is around 15-16% or so, uh, meaning about 15% of the population will report having ever used a hallucinogenic drug. Now again, this includes not just psilocybin mushrooms, but other mushrooms, also LSD, also DMT, also mescaline, also many other drugs that we haven't even talked about. The basic picture I, I get from this is that hallucinogens, including hallucinogenic mushrooms, are um, not incredibly rarely used in the population, but neither are they very commonly used. You know, the rates aren't as low as, say, heroin, but they're not as high as, say, you know, marijuana, or certainly much, much lower than something like uh, alcohol use. So with that stuff in mind, let's move forward and talk a little bit about the pharmacology of psilocybin. Well, psilocybin is a water-soluble chemical, and so it absorbs pretty easily into the body uh, through the stomach. Most people who use psilocybin are taking it orally, uh, either by um, chewing up uh, dehydrated uh, psilocybin mushrooms, like the psilocybin mexicana here pictured, or by brewing up a tea made from ground up mushrooms. Again, because it's water soluble, you can brew it into a tea and then drink the tea, or consume it mixed in with other food, you know, like ground up and put in spaghetti sauce and eaten with a plate of spaghetti, or whatever else. Not sure where I got that idea, but I'm sure someone's done it. Um, so again, basically oral administration absorption uh, through the stomach. The drug uh, distributes pretty easily throughout the body. Um, the peak uh, effects of the drug occur maybe about one or two hours into the experience. And there's relatively slow elimination of the drug, meaning that the effects of a psilocybin high can last six, eight, ten hours or more. So it's a little bit like LSD in the sense that once you use this drug, you're on a trip or on a journey that's going to last you quite a long time, which could be good or it could be bad, depending a lot on the person and the setting in which he or she is using the drug should also note that there's a lot of variability in the experiences that people have when they use psychedelic mushrooms, in part because the level of psilocybin, as well as other hallucinogenic alkaloids, varies quite a lot from mushroom to mushroom, both in terms of different species of mushrooms within the genus, psilocybe, um, and also just how, um, how much a given mushroom has developed those alkaloids. Moreover, if you buy uh, mushrooms, you know, if you buy them illegally, which you would have to do in this country, um, you can't actually be sure that what you're getting really is a psilocybin mushroom, 
or really any other sort of hallucinogenic mushroom. It may well just be an inert mushroom, like you might buy at the store, that's been sprayed uh, down with LSD or with some other synthetic hallucinogen. So it's very difficult to study what is typical for users of psilocybin, at least psilocybin in its mushroom form, because it's an illegal drug and all illegal drugs have essentially no regulation for purity uh, and, um, and sort of quality of production. So high variability. With all that in mind, what are the acute effects of mushrooms? What goes on in your body? What goes on in your brain when you consume these drugs? Well, this is a lot like LSD, and that makes sense because LSD and psilocybin are very similar in terms of how they interact with the body and the brain. So similar, as I mentioned in the last lecture, that you can de develop a pretty robust cross tolerance between the two. How that looks in the periphery is just basic sympathetic activation. Uh, as I said with LSD, this isn't as strong as we would see with a stimulant drug, but there is increased heart rate and increased blood pressure, dilated pupils, elevated body temperature, increased respiration, etc., etc. So it gives you a mild kick, at least early on in the, in the experience, although again, not so much as you would see if you were using cocaine or some other stimulant. Within the central nervous system, uh, psilocybin breaks down very quickly into psilocin, which is a somewhat more fat-soluble uh, molecule which gets into your brain pretty easily. Um, it's similar to LSD in terms of how it affects uh, the brain, particularly the serotonin trans uh, transporters um, um, and receptors. Uh, it's um, so similar that we have a pretty robust cross tolerance, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it acts a lot like LSD, but it tends to be a lot less potent than LSD. Maybe you know a very small fraction, you know, one two hundredth as potent, according to one pharmacology textbook that I have open in front of me right now, as is LSD. It, that may be in part because LSD is just a ridiculously potent drug. It's one of the most potent drugs we know in terms of how strong an effect we get from it from such small doses. Uh, in terms of psilocybin and psilocin, um, relatively low doses of it uh, produce kind of a gentle, relaxed sensation. Higher doses produce the kind of distortions in perception and maybe even frank hallucinations that we might see with LSD. Um, anecdotally, if you talk to people who use hallucinogenic drugs, they'll sometimes describe the mushroom high and here we're assuming they mean the psilocybin mushroom high as a, a kind of a more gentle or more kind of low-key hallucinogenic experience than an LSD high or a high from other hallucinogenic drugs. And that kind of makes sense because the uh, drug psilocybin and psilocin, they're much less potent than, our, um, than is LSD. So those are the acute effects of the drug. What about the chronic or long-term effects of, of this drug? Well, as I hinted earlier, there is ongoing research with psilocybin. Uh, a lot of it in this country has been conducted at Johns Hopkins University. Um, these are just generally known as the Johns Hopkins studies. There was one in 2006, one in 2008. I'm pretty sure they've more recently published as well. Um, what's nice about these uh, studies are that they use proper double-blind procedures. And if you think back to um, earlier in the semester, and we talked about experimental methods, uh, in this context, what we're doing is we're bringing people into our laboratory or into the hospital, and we're assigning them to either receive psilocybin or to see, receive methylphenidate, so Ritalin. Now here, this is valuable because both psilocybin and methylphenidate are gonna give you a slightly aroused feeling. So methylphenidate, Ritalin, acts as a reasonable placebo for psilocybin. It's gonna give you that kind of synth uh, sympathetic activation, but not going to give you the hallucinogen or the hallucinogenic effects. Um, now, people who are brought into the laboratory are blind in the sense that they don't know if the capsule they're receiving is going to include psilocybin or it's going to include methylphenidate. The researcher who is in the room with them is also blind in the sense that he or she doesn't know what's in that capsule. So he or she can't subtly hint or even accidentally suggest to the person that, oh, you know, you're going to have an interesting experience with this pill or, oh, this will be over pretty quickly. It's just methylphenidate. Um, they're double blind. The person taking the drug is blind. The person giving the drug is blind. The only person or only people who know the reality of which person has been assigned to which group are the folks who are directing the study and they're not in the room at the time. 
So it's a relatively, uh, you know, it's the gold standard of doing pharmacological research that hopefully lets us see whether the experiences that people have under psilocybin really have to do with the actual effect of the drug rather than some sort of expectation that the person may hold for what's going to happen or some sort of expectation that may be communicated to them by the researcher or the experimenter in the room. Anyway, this research has been ongoing. It's really fascinating. I'm going to put a video link on Blackboard to to a YouTube clip about this research. But the basic uh, follow-up is that um, the experiences that people have tend to be fairly positive and even at a two-month follow-up, that is two months after participation is over, uh, when people are brought back to the laboratory and just interviewed and asked to describe, well, what do you think about your experience? Has it changed your life? Has, have you thought about things differently? Most folks who are in the study report of positive experience and interestingly, many people report kind of a spiritually significant experience occurred when they used psilocybin. Um, this is something that to me is just kind of interesting. That is that something about hallucinogenic drugs generally, or maybe about psilocybin even particularly, seem to inspire a kind of a mystical or religious feeling among people. Um, I don't know why that is, and this is just me speculating at this point, but it seems that a lot of religious practice, whether it's deep prayer or meditation or kind of contemplation or deep reading of religious texts, seems to put you in a state of mind where you break down barriers between yourself and the world around you. So perhaps if you meditate for a very long time, you, you have a sense of the enhanced connectivity between you and the world, or you see people around you as not very different. They're, they're part of you, or they're related to you because of God, or because of whatever it is that you believe in. Um, now, I imagine for people who meditate or pray for long periods of time, this realization or this sense occurs over a long period of dedicated practice and patient thinking and praying and meditating. What may happen in the case of hallucinogens is within the space of a couple hours, you're put into a state of mind that really forces you to see the world differently and that maybe challenges your, your understanding of yourself as a discrete human being entirely divorced from the world around you and your consciousness as being this kind of unassailable um, aspect of your mind. You, you rather see yourself as more connected to the world around you and your consciousness as more temporary or impermanent. Again, I can only speculate here, not being a deeply religious person myself and not having ever used hallucinogenic drugs, um, but it does seem to be this interesting and kind of tantalizing idea that something about hallucinogens plugs people into kind of a potentially religious experience. By the way, this is just a picture from one of the Johns Hopkins studies, and you can see here uh, there's a, a patient who's been brought into a room. It's clearly a relaxing room. There's some sort of uh, mystical imagery around this person, including a mushroom statue and some meditation cushions, and the person is being monitored by experimenters and nurses. Uh, we should say here that uh, this person may be taking psilocybin, or she may be taking, or he, I can't quite tell with the headphones and mask, may be taking methylphenidate. Either way, they're going to be in the same room with the same people in the same pictures so as not to bias someone to think uh, that he was receiving methylphenidate or he was receiving psilocybin. An interesting picture. Anyway, um, part of this research that's going on at Johns Hopkins is in connection with a um, with uh, with a research program that's looking at how to treat people who are suffering from depression, especially people who are suffering from depression related to cancer diagnosis. Um, back when I was on my internship uh, for clinical psychology, I worked with people who were uh, di newly diagnosed with cancer who were, or who were undergoing chemotherapy or frankly were just dying from cancer. And as you might guess, or as you might know from your own experience of your family members and loved ones, rates of depression are elevated among people in this group. And it can be really heartbreaking because it's bad enough to have cancer, it's worse to feel depressed about having cancer, although it's entirely understandable. Uh, and thus, there is some interest in providing treatments that can help people uh, feel more comfortable, help people feel less depressed, perhaps help people feel more reconciled to the inevitability of their death, you know, with or without cancer. And psilocybin seems to be helpful for some folks. Um, again, I'll link to some videos that sort of document a little bit of this, including a video about this man here who describes his experience with cancer and also with psilocybin. Now, outside of this research, there doesn't seem to be a lot of long-term negative effects of using psilocybin. Um, 
it doesn't seem to be a particularly toxic drug to the body. Um, like LSD, it doesn't seem to really be uh, damaging to you. However, um, it may be disorienting or even frightening to use psychedelic drugs. That's true of LSD. It's also true of psilocybin. It's true of the other drugs that I haven't even mentioned yet. So um, I certainly don't want to argue that all drugs are safe or that even that psilocybin is safe. It seems to have some interesting therapeutic potential. Um, it seems to have maybe some religious potential if you want to think about it that way. Um, but it's worth noting that there are risks involved in using any drug. And um, with that in mind, I'm actually going to transition now and talk about a different drug. And that drug is MDMA. So what do we know about the history of MDMA? Um, unlike the other drugs that I've covered, this drug, well, unlike the other drugs I've covered except for the sedatives, this drug was developed synthetically from the get-go. It wasn't based on a, uh, an existing plant or fungus uh, alkaloid. In uh, 1912, a German chemist named Anton Kolsch uh, synthesized 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. And if you just look at that name, you can see that it's actually a form of amphetamine. Recall that back in the early part of the 20th century, there was a lot of enthusiasm for conducting chemical uh, research to kind of develop new forms of amphetamines, new forms of stimulants, you know, methamphetamines. This is a methylated amphetamine that's not methamphetamine, but different <laughs> in some fa shape, form, or fashion. Um, like I said, uh, it was developed early on in the 1900s. It was actually patented by the uh, drug company Merck, although they didn't really have a lot of use for it because it didn't seem to provide as strong a, um, a uh, stimulant boost as other existing drugs at the time. So it was like, you know, they told uh, poor Anton, the chemist, hey, good job, nice new chemical, but it's not really as good as the existing chemicals we have. So we patented it. We're not really going to do uh, anything with it, though. And poor Anton Kolsch actually died in World War One. So, he, I mean, he's remembered to us. I'm, perhaps he was a good guy, personally. He was a good chemist. But he developed a drug that didn't really make him famous at the time and didn't really do anything at the time. Um, after World War One, it was taken by the Allies as kind of a spoil of war. So basically, it was available uh, both in Europe and in America. It was known about, but wasn't really not really a lot was done with it for most of its early history. Um, in the 1950s, the Army conducted experiments using it because back then the Army and the CIA were conducting experiments with, with all sorts of drugs and uh, they really found very few useful effects of it. Again, it was a, a stimulant that wasn't really as good as the other stimulants out there, so it didn't seem to have a lot of real applications. That is, until it was kind of rediscovered in the 1970s by a guy named Alexander Shulgin. Uh, Shulgin, who actually recently died, is in a way sort of sad, um, is an American pharmacologist who uh, discovered, well, he kind of rediscovered MDMA in that he was looking over old um, chemical formulae for different drugs that had been discovered throughout the 20th century and had been patented. And he would mix up these different drugs and then conduct simple research uh, uh, experiments on them. And he published some of these experiments, uh, including experiments where he took the drug himself. He took MDMA himself. And what was interesting or really important for us is that Shulgin noticed not just that there are some stimulant effects from MDMA, which had been noticed before, but he also noticed that there are some interesting other psychological effects, particularly changes in the way people who are taking the drug felt about themselves and about other people. And even more particularly, a sense that people got when they were on MDMA that they were more caring or compassionate towards themselves and towards others. Now Shulgin had colleagues during the, this time, this was in the 1970s and into the early 1980s, who were psychotherapists and they were very interested in this drug because it seemed to help people to be able to talk about their emotions better. You know, people who took MDMA could describe more openly or perhaps even more honestly how they were feeling, especially if they're having difficult or threatening feelings. So, you know, this was the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, there were people who were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, for instance, from being in combat during the Vietnam War. Part of some, a lot of psychotherapy for people with PTSD involves revisiting difficult experiences, revisiting difficult emotions, and trying to talk about them rather than being frightened by them. 
that's easy to say, but it's probably, well, it's not probably, it is certainly very hard to do. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for MDMA as a drug that maybe could help people talk about those feelings. There's also enthusiasm for MDMA among people who were marriage and family or couples and family therapists, because, you know, as anyone knows who's been in a relationship that involves fighting, uh, it can be hard to talk to someone when you're angry. It can be hard to talk openly about feelings when you're feeling hurt or threatened. And so if people who work with couples, who work with families, were very interested in the idea that MDMA could help people break down some of their barriers, talk more openly about their feelings, and hopefully achieve uh, some, some benefit from, um, from therapy. So a little bit like how we saw with LSD, um, there was this idea that maybe using this drug could help people get at stuff in their mind that they were having a hard time getting at uh, without the drug, particularly in the case of MDMA, emotions, feelings that people have about themselves and about others. So that was kind of the psychotherapeutic interest in MDMA. There was also around this time kind of a, a surge in recreational use of the drug. Some of this can actually be traced to a really interesting fellow named Michael Clegg. He was a former seminarian who popularized the use of MDMA and sold it in mostly in the t Dallas area of Texas during the 1980s. And to be clear, um, Clegg discovered this drug or was introduced to it because as part of his training uh, in seminary, he learned sort of couples and counseling and sort of marital counseling and psychotherapy counseling techniques techniques and heard about MDMA. MDMA was legal during this time in history and he took it himself, he gave it to people he knew and he felt that it was really nice. He, he felt kind of warm and happy about himself, he felt like he was in love with other people and so he figured let's sell this stuff. And the history of Clegg is sort of an interesting history because for a while it's almost like if you could imagine someone who's a, like a drug kingpin but selling an entirely legal drug. There's this period of time in America, especially in Texas, where MDMA was super popular and super legal and people would just take some ecstasy and go to um, like a country bar and do some line dancing and have a good old time, I suppose. By the way, Clegg is the person who's credited with developing the name ecstasy or naming ecstasy for the drug MDMA. Well, anyway, as we see with the history of so many drugs, after an initial period of enthusiasm, there's a period of, of concern. Uh, concern over the unregulated use of the drug and concern over the possibility of overdose. Uh, in the case of MDMA, there were, during the early 1980s, um, you know, a handful of deaths associated with using MDMA. People died from hyperthermia, that's where your body becomes too hot, and also from dehydration. Uh, typically what was happening is people were going to uh, bars or dance clubs or, you know, dance festivals, and they were taking uh, MDMA, they were feeling a lot of energy from the drug and also a lot of happiness about being dancing and out with all these other people. And they would just dance and, and socialize for long periods of time while getting hotter and hotter and hotter, not noticing this and probably not drinking enough water. And over time, you know, if you overheat your body, you will damage various organ systems and you can ultimately die from that. That's certainly what seems to have happened with folks who were taking MDMA, at least some small fraction of people who were taking MDMA. There was also some a uh, little bit of early research on the potential risks of use of the drug. And in very quick fashion, um, not in 1970, I, I forget exactly which year it was, but uh, sure, in the early 1980s, MDMA was added to Schedule 1 of the Comprehensive Drug Control Act. Um, now in a way, uh, you might you know, scratch your head and think, wait a sec, does MDMA have some medical or psychotherapeutic uses? Perhaps it does. Um, does it have a high potential for abuse? I'm not so sure it does. Um, why is MDMA on Schedule 1 instead of maybe Schedule 3 or even Schedule 2? Um, I don't know. And this is just another example of how the illegality or legality of a drug has a lot more to do with perceptions of risk than actual um, empirical evidence of risk. And it just happens to be the case that in the early 80s, there's a real push to take this new drug, MDMA, which seemed so tantalizing with its possibilities and make it very illegal very quickly. And that's basically what happened. So once MDMA was scheduled, uh, legal use of it, of course, stopped immediately and illegal use of the drug began. Um, organized crime outfits uh, produced MDMA in Europe and smuggled it back into America. 
And interestingly, as we saw with LSD, there was this period of time in the 80s and 90s where there was a kind of an overlap between the use of psychedelic drugs, including LSD, including MDMA, and electronic dance music. And if you're a fan of techno or house or whatever it is people listen to these days, um, this probably makes some sense. If you go to a club or an outdoor festival and you listen to this kind of repetitive sort of hypnotic music, it may be helpful or enjoyable to be on a drug which is going to really profoundly change the way you see the world around you. you know, the music seems more interesting. The lasers seem more interesting. Maybe in the case of MDMA, you feel kind of empathic and connected to all the people in the the other dancers around you. Um, it's also the case that just there were people who were bringing electronic music to America from Europe and uh, a lot of the folks who were setting up illegal and kind of semi-legal parties uh, in Chicago or in Los Angeles or in New York were, you know, found a good way to bring drugs into the country illegally and sell them very quickly to large groups of people. So for reasons that probably have to do with art and reasons that have to do with commerce, there was this kind of overlap between dance music and ecstasy and dance music and LSD and dance music and some of these other drugs that we can talk about. In the 1990s, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, that's uh, part of the National Institutes of Health, a um, research organization that's funded by the federal government, published a series of, of, of warnings in advertisements called the Your Brain on Ecstasy campaign that emphasized the risks associated with using MDMA. And particularly, they made use of the relative, well, it wasn't totally new, but at the time it seemed very new, uh, techniques in brain imaging that were becoming popular then. So pictured here, you can see an image taken from a positron emission tomography scan or PET scan showing um, different levels of brain activity. In the left, it's a normal brain, and in the right, it's a brain of someone who's used ecstasy. And, you know, this sort of discrepancy between these two images led to this phrase, the ecstasy, or this idea that was popularized in a phrase, the ecstasy created holes in the brain that somehow turned your brain into Swiss cheese. Uh, I remember this from the 1990s, you know, being in uh, in uh, in high school and later in college, just you know, seeing these type of advertisements and this campaign, and being told by uh, healthcare professionals and teachers uh, that MDMA was this drug which seemed so great, it could make you feel so good, but secretly it was destroying your brain. Um, we'll return to that idea and that research a little bit later in this lecture because I think it's worth some consideration. But suffice it to say, by the you know mid to late 1990s, about the time use of uh, hallucinogenic drugs, including ecstasy, was peaking. There was this real pushback to uh, advertise and to emphasize the risks or apparent risks associated with the drug. And um, again, we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But before we get there, I want to address the issue of drug purity. And the reason I want to is because recently, and recently meaning in the last couple of years, MDMA has ca had kind of a a second life or a, a yet again kind of resurgence in popularity in the form of a dust or powder of, of uh, MDMA rather than the pill form which it was typically given in, in previous uh, years. And it's sometimes called molly and it's sold as a powder and it certainly has a certain popularity uh, both in you know pop culture and songs. You sometimes hear people referencing it. And uh, the popularity of molly has a lot to do with the perception of how pure or impure ecstasy is. And the simple truth is that most MDMA that you would buy uh, illegally, because of course it's all illegal, is not really just MDMA. It's a mixture of other drugs. Those could be amphetamines, dextromethorphan, synthetic LSD, other just random stuff. Um, again, I remember in the, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s uh, living in Florida and having a friend who uh, whose boyfriend was a pretty significant drug dealer. And I remember asking her about ecstasy at the time because we used to talk about electronic music like techno and, and trance music and all that stuff. And I said, you know, is it that, you know, can people still get ecstasy? And she said, yeah, you kind of can, but you kind of can't. Because if you're buying a pill that your dealer is telling you is ecstasy, in all likelihood, there's little or no real MDMA in there. It's a mixture of other cheaper drugs that are easier to get and easier to, to pack together. Um, this is good for the drug dealer because it makes his job or her job easier. It's bad for the user because, of course, you don't know what you're taking or how much of it you're taking. And there are always risks of dangerous interactions between uh, drugs. 
and um, I'll provide some links on Blackboard, but essentially research that's been done backs up this anecdotal account that I've, I've just given you. Uh, when uh, people voluntarily give over drugs that they've purchased or when police seize drugs and do the, uh, and send them in for chemical analysis, typically a pill of so-called ecstasy or so-called MDMA has little or no real MDMA in it and instead is just a mixture of other synthetic drugs that mimic maybe the apparent effects of MDMA. And as I said more recently, maybe in the last three years or so, um, you've heard or we have heard and we've seen the popularity of a drug called Molly uh, increase. Molly is just powdered MDMA. Molly, I think, is meant to be short for molecule and is meant to in some way suggest that while MDMA pills are kind of dirty and adulterated and not pure at all, if you buy Molly, you're getting the real stuff. You're getting the real pure MDMA powder and that this should somehow be safer for you. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago reading a New York Times article about this where the reporter interviewed people who, who used Molly and all of them claimed that, well, you know, I don't like to take dirty drugs, you know, if you buy MDMA it pills, who, who knows what you're getting, so I purchase Molly instead because it's just the pure MDMA. Now, of course, that's absolutely not true. Um, you can grind up a pill into powder, or you can make a powder that's a mixture of other random drugs. There's really no way to tell if the Molly powder that you're buying is in any way pure MDMA or not just a bunch of other drugs. And again, there's some interesting links I'll provide. Um, lately, lately being in the last year or so, the drug which seems to be most, most commonly substituted in for molly or even just in pill form for MDMA is uh, synthetic cathinone, so uh, bath salts that people are buying and using. So history of MDMA is a weird history. It was a super popular and interesting drug for a while. It became incredibly illegal and has had this kind of mysterious life in real or adulterated form ever since. With all that in mind, what do we know about the current use of MDMA? Well, monitoring the future asks people about their use of ecstasy or MDMA. And keep in mind, someone who says they've used ecstasy maybe hasn't really. They've just used some other combination of drugs that were given to them in a pill or in a powder. But uh, allowing for that, maybe 5 or 6% of 12th graders in 2014 said that they'd ever used MDMA. If we look at the trends over time, we see this kind of rise in the late 1990s and then kind of a fall and kind of a leveling out in the 2000s. And you can see, you know, at present in 2014, it's maybe four or five percent of people. This graph is slightly different than the figure I previously gave you, and I'm not honestly sure why that is. But you get the basic idea that the um, use of the drug is, you know, not incredibly popular. Uh, by the way, another thing I don't like about this graph is that they fiddled with the y-axis. So to kind of exaggerate, I think, how how high a, a, a climb or how steep a climb there was in the popularity of the drug in the late 1990s. But bottom line is it's not a very commonly used drug. Um, a bit like the other hallucinogenic drugs, it's not as rare as, let's say, heroin, nor is it as common as, let's say, marijuana. Um, and there's low to moderate, I guess, perceived availability of the drug. If we look at the risk associated with using the drug, we see a pattern that's similar to a lot of other drugs where there's kind of a moderate assumed risk or perceived risk of using the drug and kind of a generally high disapproval of using the drug for whatever that's worth. We look at the National Survey of Drug Use and Health for the year 2013, and we ask about MDMA use among people who are uh, age 12 or older. You know, six or seven percent of the whole population will have ever used the drug, um, which is, you know, not too surprising. It's kind of about what we would figure. So again, it's not a very commonly used drug, nor is it incredibly rare. But again, you know, anytime someone says they've used MDMA, there's a real question mark as to did they really use MDMA or did they just use some random mixture of other drugs that some unscrupulous chemist put together in a pill or in a powder and then sold? We don't know. They don't know. Anyway, what's the pharmacology of MDMA? Let's just talk about that really quickly. Um, MDMA is water soluble. It uh, absorbs pretty quickly into the body. Um, that's not surprising. It was a drug that was designed to be used by humans and to be taken in pill form. It distributes uh, rather easily through the body. Um, 
the peak blood levels of the drug occur between one and three hours after ingestion, which is roughly about the time we get the peak effects that people report uh, from the drug. Like other uh, hallucinogens, it eliminates relatively slowly, or indeed uh, you know, it's the effects of it kind of linger for three or four hours, not nearly as long as say psilocybin or LSD, not quite as short as let's say cocaine. Again, almost highlighting how uh, MDMA could sort of be grouped in with the stimulants, it could sort of be grouped in with the hallucinogens, it's this weird sort of uh, drug almost on its own. As I said now quite a few different times, uh, there's a lot of variability in the uh, sort of timeline of the effects of the drug, partly because when you take a pill of ecstasy or MDMA, or you sniff or eat some powder of, um, of molly, you might be getting MDMA, you're probably getting a lot of other drugs. Uh, the amount of MDMA you're getting may be as little as none, uh, so how quickly it's going to affect you or the types of effects you're going to have are really hard to predict for any one person at any one time. With all that in mind, what are the acute effects of MDMA as best as we know? Well, before the drug was made illegal, there was a fair bit of research on this, so we know what should happen when someone takes MDMA. We should see sympathetic activation, so again this is a lot like stimulants because of course MDMA was developed as a stimulant, um, however as I noted earlier in the lecture it's not nearly so strong as the other stimulants, uh, so we see increased heart rate and blood pressure, dilated pupils, elevated body temperature, that's all about the same. Uh, although not as strong as other stimulants. It's also similar to what we see with other hallucinogens. Um, note here this idea of elevated body temperature can be dangerous. It's probably not dangerous if you're sitting comfortably in a room talking with another person or having a relaxing afternoon together. Um, it could be dangerous if you're in a situation where you're already likely to be overheating. So if you're at a dance club or if you're at an outdoor music festival and you're dancing for long periods of time, even without drugs, you're probably probably going to get dehydrated and overheated. The drugs, whether they're uh, stimulants or hallucinogens, are going to make that problem potentially a lot worse. And there's certainly some risk associated with using drugs under those settings uh, for the reason that you can overheat your body, you can dehydrate your body, your kidneys can start to fail, other organ systems can start to fail, and you can do yourself quite a lot of damage. In the central nervous system, uh, MDMA affects the you know, different aspects of the monoamine systems, meaning it affects dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, to basically stimulating the release of these neurotransmitters, blocking their reuptake, especially in uh, sort of the frontal regions of the cortex and also regions of the limbic system. Um, we have a very strong effect, or the drug has a very strong effect on emotions, especially strong positive emotions. It makes people feel happy. It also, interestingly, makes people want to interact with each other. So people who take ecstasy will report feeling very close and sort of loving and warm and connected to other people, even if those other people are strangers, you know or just other people at the dance club or other people at the music festival who you really have no obvious connection to. If you take MDMA, you feel like, gosh, I love those people and they love me and we're all here together. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, those are the typical anecdotal accounts you hear from people who take MDMA, or at least pure or real MDMA as compared to all the other random stuff that is in their pill. Um, what's interesting though is we see some distortions of perception, so that's similar to the other hallucinogens, but not nearly so strong. So we don't see the really profound and strange uh, changes in the way you view the world around you under MDMA that we would see under psilocybin or especially under LSD or some of the other, uh, some of the other uh, hallucinogenic drugs. So what about the chronic effects of MDMA? Those were the acute effects. What are the chronic effects that happen? What goes on if you take the drug over longer periods of time? Well, anecdotally, we hear accounts of changes in mood that can occur after people have used MDMA, at least in the short run after use. This is sometimes called Suicide Tuesday, uh, meaning uh, you go to a club or you go to a party on the weekend and you take ecstasy, but then by Monday or Tuesday of the following week, you feel kind of depressed. Um, now this could be just you always feel sort of depressed on Tuesday because it's Tuesday, or it could be kind of a withdrawal effect from taking the drug. The high high of positive feelings is balanced out by the low low of negative feelings uh, the next day on or a few days on. Um, 
it's difficult to study this uh, these effects right now because again MDMA is at this point in history illegal um, so what research on the research on MDMA typically does is it compares people who use MDMA to people who don't use MDMA you know, rather than assigning people to use drugs or giving them drugs in a laboratory you just go out and you gather a group of people some of whom use MDMA on their own time many of whom do not and you in a non-experimental -experiment, way can uh, compare them but these comp comparisons can be tricky because we typically see among people who use drugs in general higher levels of impulsivity and higher levels of negative mood. So to the extent that we observe the ecstasy users, you know, people who gen you know, from time to time use ecstasy in their life tend to have higher levels of negative mood. We don't know if that's because they use ecstasy or just because in general we find drug users, users to have higher levels of negative mood. Um, this is that old correlation and causation problem that we encounter a lot in science. Um, does change in mood uh, cause the differences in use? You know, does being kind of a somewhat depressed person make you want to use a drug that seems to take away those feelings? Or does using a drug change the way you feel? Or indeed, could both of those things happen? The bottom line is there do seem to be mood differences between people who use MDMA and people who don't as there are between people who use drugs and people who don't, um, but we're not really sure what's the cause and what's the effect. One way to try and disentangle this is to follow people over time. That is, take a group of people and track them over time to see if, as some folks use more and more ecstasy, do their mood problems get worse? Uh, that would give us a sense of the relative cause and the relative effect of those two variables. And there is some research that's done this. It's tracked people over time, those who use ecstasy and those who don't. But the findings are fairly mixed. There's some research suggesting that there's increase in, ne in negative mood the longer people use ecstasy. Um, there's some studies that find essentially no change or no difference. And this kind of is similar to uh, the idea of uh, the relationship between mental illness and use of ecstasy. Um, we find higher rates of mental illness, particularly mood and anxiety disorders, among people who use um, LSD, or, I'm sorry, who use MDMA. Uh, but it's interesting to note that those changes, um, I'm sorry, those illnesses tend to precede use rather than follow it. So it may be the case that people who are anxious or depressed are attracted to using a drug that could change those feelings, at least temporarily. So this kind of, of course, raises the idea or the possibility that if there are changes in mood or if there are differences in mood, those could be reflected uh, in terms of how neurotransmitter systems uh, within the brain are changing while someone's using ecstasy and after they've stopped. So we know, or at least we think we know pretty well how the short-term changes in mood that accompany ecstasy use occur. And I think I've used this image before in a previous slide, but I'll, um, or a previous lecture, but I'll use it again here. Um, what we've pictured here is kind of a cartoon representation of a serotonin uh, neurotransmitter system. So there's one um, axon of one uh, neuron at the top and then the dendrite of another at the bottom. You can see the dendrite has all these little serotonin receptors. The um, presynaptic neuron releases serotonin, those little uh, purple triangular shapes, which drift across the synapse, interact with receptors, then pop back off, drift back across the synapse and get recycled. And you can see this kind of little green molecule representation that's supposed to be the recycler or the reuptake uh, mechanism. During ecstasy, uh, part of what ecstasy does is it stimulates the release of serotonin and other neurotransmitters, but it also blocks that reuptake, that kind of uh, recycling effect, with the result that during the period of time that someone's using ecstasy, there's a buildup of serotonin within the synapse, and lots of those receptors get activated very rapidly and very frequently, which is related, we think, to the changes in perception and changes in mood that occurred during acute or short-term you know, use of ecstasy. Now, the idea is that after using ecstasy, you know, in the days, hours and days that follow, um, a lot of the serotonin has been used up, it's kind of chemically degraded, it hasn't been recycled, so it takes a while 
for the presynaptic neuron to build up its store of serotonin again. And during that period of hours and days after use, there's less serotonin to communicate or to facilitate communication between the neurons, and there are decreased levels of activity in these uh, neurotransmitter systems. So there's decreased mood. The world, which formerly seemed full of love and connection, now seems kind of cold and, and not loving and not connected, and people feel isolated and lonely. Again, this idea of, uh, of Suicide Tuesday. That seems to be what occurs over the short term when someone is actively using the drug and maybe in the hours or days following drug use. And there is speculation that over long term, because of the repeated overstimulation of the presynaptic neurons, there's actual damage to them. And either the uh, presynaptic neurons kind of break down and they're less able to release serotonin, or even the postsynaptic neurons change their number and population of receptors, and the whole system becomes down-regulated and even damaged over time from being repeatedly stimulated. This is the idea of long-term effects long-term damage that might uh, you know, contribute to long-term changes in mood that could take place days and weeks and even months after use. Like I said earlier, some of this research is supported, um, or, or some of this idea is supported by research which seems to show changes in activity in the brain of users as compared to former users. So here we've got an image again from a PET scan that shows you know, relatively diffuse activity in the cortex, um, that's the lighter colored purple, and then after use, you know, after some period of use, there's a lot less activity. You know, again, suggesting that, that uh, you know, in some way ecstasy, as good as it may make you feel, is somehow damaging your brain, making it less able to do what it's supposed to do, perhaps especially to do the kind of emotional processing that it normally does when you interact with the world around you, and particularly with people around you. Now, it's important to say at this point that when we do neuroimaging studies, we have to be pretty careful about the way in which we make comparisons between, let's say, people who use ecstasy and people who do not use ecstasy, people before they've used ecstasy and people who've after they've used ecstasy. And some of the research that was funded and kind of promoted by NIDA uh, back in the 1990s, the you know, this is your brain on ecstasy research has been criticized for really poor uh, methodology, particularly comparing users to non-users without trying to control for the use of not just ecstasy, but the use of other drugs. So for instance, in some of the research that was done that you looked at human users and compared them to humans who did not use ecstasy, the people who used ecstasy also used a lot of other drugs like cocaine or methamphetamine or just more alcohol, more tobacco. Uh, so it's possible that differences in brain activity could be related to the MDMA, but they could be related to other drugs or just other risk factors for being a drug user, uh, like mental illness, for instance. Um, it's not, you know, it's tempting, and it was at the time, I, I imagine, very tempting for the researchers to, to conclude, aha, it's the ecstasy that's causing these changes in brain activity, particularly in regions of the brain that process emotions. But, you know, further review of this research and further consideration of it makes those conclusions suspect. Uh, it could be that MDMA was causing damage and decreasing activity, or it could be that a lot of other factors were leading to those effects as well. So to be clear, um, other labs that have attempted to replicate these findings in more recent years haven't been able to repeat them. So uh, they have seen in terms of long, when uh, folks have tried to do research by more carefully comparing people who've used ecstasy to folks who have not used ecstasy while trying to exclude people who use a lot of other drugs as well and just get a more pure comparison of ecstasy versus non-ecstasy, the results don't seem to be nearly as strong uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that there's long-term changes in serotonin activity, um, and it's not clear that those effects that do occur are re uh, irreversible, that you somehow damage your brain if you use this drug and the changes uh, can, or the, the damage or the changes can never be repaired. Um, if you think back uh, to maybe some of the early science classes you took in high school or maybe even in junior high, you'll probably remember this idea as the idea of replication. We ought to be able to repeat a finding 
uh, you know, like if I have a laboratory and I do a study, an experiment, let's say, and I claim a particular finding, like ecstasy leads to change in this part of the brain, then you and your laboratory should be able to do the same thing. And if you can repeat my work and get roughly the same results, and if someone else can repeat the work and get roughly the same results, then over time, we as a group of scientists become more confident in the validity or the truthfulness of those results. Um, if you can't repeat my work, if you make an honest effort and you still can't, you can't get the same results I got, and then maybe someone else can't get those results, and maybe someone else can't, then maybe it looks like I either accidentally or deliberately messed something up, and there really isn't an effect the way I thought there was. So to be clear, and to put this into context, some of the research, uh, again, research that I remember from back in the 90s, that uh, seemed to suggest that there were differences in the level of activity in the brain, especially activity in serotonin systems, especially serotonin systems that have to do with emotions, differences between people who used ecstasy and those who did not, a lot of that research hasn't really held up over time. Um, and has caused some folks to question whether the risks associated with MDMA are as bad as perhaps they were initially uh, uh, thought of being. Now, some of the other research ba from back in the day that seemed to suggest damage associated with ecstasy use or MDMA use came from not human research, but non-human animal research, research with rats, research with monkeys, etc. Now, clearly, um, you know, one of the advantages of working with with uh, non-human animals is you can more directly examine their brains. You, rather than using a brain scan, you can simply kill the animal and cut open its brain and, and section it out. Here is an image that used to be on the NIDA website where um, serotonin neurons have been stained in this purple color. Um, this is from an animal, I actually forget whether it's a monkey or a rat, uh, under normal circumstances after being given ecstasy two weeks afterwards and then even seven years afterwards. So it's probably not a rat because they don't live that long. So let's assume it's a monkey. And you can see the, the uh, idea that's being suggested here is that ecstasy damages serotonin neurons in the short run and that some of that repair, some of that damage can be repaired, but much of it can't even many years after the fact. Uh, so again, this idea that serotonin, or I'm, I'm sorry, that MDMA can have damages or pokes holes in the brain, you know, figuratively speaking, was supported from some of this research uh, using, um, using non-human animals. Now, the tricky thing about research with non-human animals is, of course, dosing. Uh, you know, animals like mice or monkeys are smaller than humans, so figuring out what dose in animals corresponds to a comparable dose in humans is tricky. It's especially tricky with an illegal drug because, of course, we don't know how much of the drug users are using in their typical uh, lives because drugs are illegal and, um, you know, we don't carefully regulate how much of ecstasy is in, how much MDMA is in the ecstasy pill that someone's buying and using. There can also be differences um, where, in terms of how the drug is used, whether the drug is injected in the case of animals or whether it's administered orally in the case of humans. And some of the research that was funded by NIDA and was published in the 1990s um, that looked at non-human animals uh, and initially seemed to suggest this damaging effect involved uh, monkeys who were not actually given MDMA but were rather given methamphetamine and were given quite a lot of methamphetamine. Um, so the damage associated with uh, the drug may have had more to do with the damaging effects of meth use, especially at high doses, than with MDMA. Um, this was actually kind of a controversial thing because the original research was published in the journal Science, which is an incredibly prestigious journal and was later retracted because the researchers who did the study had to admit that, well, we made a mistake, or so they claimed. We didn't really give those monkeys MDMA. We gave them methamphetamine instead. So the damage maybe uh, has nothing to do with MDMA at all. Now, to be clear, if you crack open any good pharmacology textbook nowadays, you'll see that there is evidence that, or based on non-human animals, evidence that uh, the MDMA itself, not just methamphetamine, but even straight MDMA can be damaging to serotonin neurons. What is less clear is whether those damaging effects are irreversible. So some of the early um, concern about this, uh, the dangers of the drug, the neurotoxic effects of MDMA were not supported by research. There's some more recent research that suggests there may be some 
deleterious or damaging effects of MDMA, it's just not clear how bad they are or how long-lasting they are. And that actually leads me to my last part of this lecture, and I realize now looking at the clock is a fairly long lecture, so if you've made it this far, thanks for your attention. And that last part is just what's the risk? What are the risks of using MDMA? Well, one risk associated with this drug is dosing. And this is generally true of all illegal drugs because you just don't know how strong a drug you're getting if you're buying it illegally. If you buy a legal drug that's dispensed by a pharmacy with a prescription from a doctor, you know precisely how many milligrams are in your drug. I mean, even over-the-counter drugs. If you take uh, Tylenol, you know how much acetaminophen is in each pill, and that's regulated by the government. If you buy a pill of ecstasy or a bag of molly, or for that matter, a tab of LSD, or even you know something like marijuana, you just don't know how strong the drug is. You don't know the concentration of the active chemicals in it. In the case of MDMA, it's especially bad because there are real questions about the purity of the stuff that someone that you're buying if you're buying this drug on the street. There's ample evidence that most, or if not all, of a typical ecstasy pill is not MDMA, or a typical baggie of powder is not Molly, or you know, Molly is not actually MDMA, but rather a bunch of other stuff, and who knows what that other stuff can be. And as we know, generally speaking, mixing drugs can produce unexpected and difficult um, and maybe even dangerous uh, outcomes. So some of the risk of MDMA is really a risk that arises from the illegality of the drug uh, rather than from the drug itself. Without being regulated, uh, we just don't know what we're buying and we don't know what we're using. Another risk that occurs with this drug is the risk of hyperthermia and dehydration. Um, you know, clearly people who use this drug, like people who use other hallucinogens, especially like people who use stimulants in settings that are hot and crowded, where they're not drinking enough water, where they're exercising or dancing, can risk overheating their bodies and dehydrating their bodies, which can absolutely be lethal to do. There's also some risk uh, for addiction to MDMA. Addiction in the sense of wanting to have positive feelings, you know, pursuing, uh, having the positive reinforcement of feeling good, feeling a loving connection to the world around you, and negative reinforcement, using to avoid the unpleasant feelings that you have when you stop using the drug. So can people overdose on MDMA? Absolutely. Can they become addicted to MDMA? Absolutely they can. Um, it's not as rough and long-term a ride as other hallucinogens. There doesn't seem to be evidence that people become particularly addicted to psilocybin or to LSD. It seems possible, and there is evidence, that people can become addicted to MDMA. And finally, as I said previously, there is this kind of open question about how damaging or not damaging serotonin uh, MDMA is to the serotonin systems of their of your brain. Uh, most recent research suggests that damage can occur when you use MDMA. So if we look at good recent research that's well conducted with non-human animals, we see that MDMA damages serotonin uh, neurons in different parts of the brain, and it makes sense that this damage could lead to cognitive impairment or mood impairment. What is less clear is how uh, whether this type of damage would occur in humans, and if it didn't occur in humans, whether it would be permanent or whether it would be damage that the brain would repair over time. Um, again, without uh, with the drug being illegal, it's difficult to do research on it. It's difficult to know to a level of comfortable certainty how this would work in human systems. Although there is reason to be uh, uh, concerned, maybe even um, very concerned about the possibility of damage to the brain from this drug. Okay, so gosh, it's been a long lecture. I'm again looking at the clock and realizing it. So thanks so much for sticking with it. Uh, preview for next time, we'll be talking about the opiates, a really wonderfully interesting group of drugs, at least to talk about. <laughs> useful, I'm sure. Wonderful, I guess, under the right circumstances, but uh, certainly wonderful and interesting and useful to talk about. So I'm looking forward to those lectures. Uh, thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it. As usual, if you have questions about the lecture, put them in the comments section of YouTube. Put them in the discussion boards of Blackboard. If you're on Blackboard, look for some links that I'm going to try and leave you to some really interesting videos and interesting information about uh, MDMA and other hallucinogens. I think you'll find it very interesting. 
Uh, as I always say, thank, thanks for your attention. And if you have a chance to step away from the laptop or the tablet and enjoy a bit of the day, please do so. Let this information sink in. And then when you're ready, come back because I'll be here with another lecture. Thanks. Bye-bye.